October 20th, 1939. Many of you know that I've covered the First World War week by week as well as this one. In that war, we saw several tales of swashbuckling daring do on the high seas. Well, guess what? In that respect, this war is no different. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, the Soviet Union made demands on Finland for territorial concessions, ostensibly to protect their own borders. The Finns said no. Hitler issued a directive stating that he wanted to attack in Western Europe now in 1939, and both sides were debating how best to use Norway and its waters to their own advantage, particularly concerning submarines. And submarines are in the news this week. I mentioned last week, a German sub U-47 under Gunter Prien had left base at Kiel, navigated through Britain's entire defense net, and surfaced at the end of the week at Scapa Flow, the British naval base, undetected, right? Well, at 1 a.m. on the 14th, Prien's first torpedoes hit the battleship HMS Royal Oak in the bows. Prien reloads and repositions. There is no reaction from shore yet. At 1.23 come three more torpedoes, followed immediately by explosions that tear the Royal Oak apart and which finally raise the alarm. 883 crew members are lost. Prien escapes to open sea. Three days later, he arrives in Wilhelmshaven and is welcomed by Grand Admiral Erich Räder. Prien and crew fly to Berlin, where Prien is awarded the Ritterkreuz, Knight's Cross, the highest level of the Iron Cross, by Adolf Hitler himself. However, that success aside, this month four German U-boats are disabled in the English Channel, and in future, they're routed around Britain when traveling to and from home. But there are other navies besides the British and Germans. I mentioned the Polish Navy last week, but not the Polish Submarine Division. This was just five ships, and they were mostly used to monitor German naval activity. Back on September 7th, they had been ordered to the Central Baltic, but most had maintenance issues. See, normally, they were docked each May and October for maintenance and repair. But because of the tense international situation, that had not happened this past May. So they've gone nearly a year without being fixed. I read in Poland Betrayed that back on September 14th, in the middle of the German invasion of Poland, the division CO sent this message to his five commanders. Carry out patrols and interdict enemy shipping as long as possible. When unable to operate further, break out for United Kingdom. If that is impossible, seek internment in Sweden. When approaching Great Britain, contact Rosside on 133 kilo cycles and rendezvous 30 miles off May Island in the Firth of Forth. Well, two of them had been so badly damaged by depth charges and aerial attacks that they opted for Sweden. They were soon joined by a third, so over 200 Polish naval personnel were interned in Sweden. The other two, the Vilk and Orschel, made it to Rosside. The Vilk, despite being under heavy German attacks, reached Rosside September 20th. The Orschel, well, that is a wartime epic of an adventure. It patrolled the Baltic for a couple of days until the captain ordered it to head for Tallinn, Estonia, instead of Sweden. He was having stomach pains and was taken to a local hospital there. So Jan Grudzinski, lieutenant commander, took over. Estonia is neutral, so by international law, he had 24 hours to leave port. But since a German freighter was also due to leave, Orgel's departure was delayed. This was also okay under international law, by the way. But the Poles were told that since they had overstayed, they were going to be interned. The breech locks of their ship's guns were removed, as were 15 of their 20 torpedoes and they were relieved of all of their navigation charts and small arms. So Grudzinski snuck out and sawed through the hawsers holding them in port to the point where they were basically being held by only threads. The night of September 17th, two of his sailors snuck ashore and cut the lead of the big searchlight that illuminated Orgel, plunging it into darkness. Then the two Estonian guards were overpowered, the hawsers quickly severed, and the Orgel took off. The British Admiralty report of that night reads, Out into the night and freedom. They were seen and fired on by heavy artillery, which drove them under the water, and presently they heard the propellers of the destroyers and motors in pursuit of them. All night they fled submerged, steering blindly with no chart to give them soundings, and at dawn they lay down on the bottom. During the day, they heard the hunters passing to and fro over them. Depth charges burst around them, some near, some far till they lost count of the explosions. 
At midnight, they rose cautiously and had a look around. They judged themselves to be at the entrance to the Gulf of Finland, and there was nothing in sight. You gotta hand it to the British Admiralty. They got some pretty lyrical writers, you know, guys? Anyhow, Krujinski decides not to make for Britain, but to continue cruising the Baltic looking for Germans or Russians, since by now the Soviet Union has also invaded Poland. But first, he needs a safe spot where he can remain on the surface and recharge his sub's batteries. It would also be nice if he could find a German merchant ship to board and get some charts and maps, but that does not happen. He does, however, get his batteries recharged. But by this time, the whole thing had become a huge international incident. The USSR accused Estonia of letting them escape, and the German radio accused the Poles of murdering those poor, innocent Estonian guards. Those guards, by the way, were safely aboard the Orgel until they were dropped off on the well-populated Swedish island of Gotland with money, cigarettes, and whiskey. By September 20th, There were two Soviet cruisers and eight destroyers looking for the Orsha, but it cruised the Baltics for two weeks until finally deciding to head for Scotland. Their only navigational aid was a list of lighthouses, so they used them to travel the Danish coast. They escaped German destroyers in the Sund, but briefly ran aground. They made it to the North Sea, where they came under attack by both the Germans and the British because their wireless equipment had been damaged and they had no way to identify themselves. Finally, They lay on the bottom of the sea off the east coast of Scotland, where they managed to repair their radio enough to transmit a weak signal. This week on the 14th, now identified as a friendly vessel, a Royal Navy destroyer escorts them into port. Yet their home nation is now in foreign hands. And those foreign hands need to decide how it is to be governed. Well, territory not formally annexed by Germany or the USSR is put under German civil administration and called the general government. It is also announced by Germany that their army will no longer have administrative control. Hans Frank will run things beginning next month in the general government region. Albert Forster in Danzig and Arthur Greiser in Posen. All three are senior Nazi party members and are to prevent any sort of Polish leadership and make Poland so poor that Poles will want to work subservient jobs in Germany. Forster and Greiser are furthermore to transform their regions into pure Germanic provinces. On the 22nd, the Germans will begin deporting Poles from Poznan, the largest city in western Poland. But already on the 16th, all Poles are ordered to leave Gdynia, taking only what of their lives they can carry. Also this week on the 19th, the first Jewish ghetto is established in Lublin. And in those conquered Polish lands this week, by decree, the Council of Ministers for the Defense of the Reich under Hermann Goering, SS field divisions, those people mainly responsible for the ongoing campaign of terror and execution, now have judicial independence from the German army. So SS soldiers can no longer be tried by army courts martial, but only by their own superiors. OKH, Oberkommando des Heeres, the German army high command issues Fallgelb, Plan Yellow, on the 19th. This is the response to Hitler's directive from last week about a new offensive in the West and will be a holding action on the French border, the main German attack to come through central Belgium, and with some attacks on the Dutch on the right flank. Even at this point, and it's already being debated and modified, nobody seems really happy with it. And to the North, neither the Finns nor the Soviets are happy. They meet again the 14th, and the Finns continue to refuse Soviet demands. This frustrates Joseph Stalin to the point that he warns that an accident might occur between Soviet and Finnish troops if negotiations take too long. But Soviet troops are elsewhere on the move this week. Last month, the USSR signed a pact with Estonia that allows the Soviets to keep thousands of soldiers on Estonian bases. This week, the first of those forces arrive. Stalin has promised in return to respect Estonian independence. And as those soldiers arrive, 12,600 Baltic Germans now leave Estonia heading west. It's not just in Poland that the Germans are resettling. And that is the week. Nautical tales of heroism on both sides. Germany more formally organizing the dehumanization process of the Poles, the Soviets entering Estonia, and the Finns still refusing to be swayed. And the SS now answers only to itself. Well, and to Hitler and Himmler, But a couple weeks ago, Hitler pardoned everyone in Poland who had committed war crimes. 
So they should be okay there. It's October 20th, 1939. Two months ago, Poland was an independent nation and the Soviet Union was negotiating with Britain and France. Now Poland has been overrun and both the occupying Germans and Soviets are committing barbaric atrocities against the Polish people. The Baltics are coming under Stalin's sway and Hitler is planning an attack in the West where hundreds of thousands of allied soldiers await them. Think of your life, your world, two months ago. Has it changed this much since then? Madness. If you'd like to see more tales of submarines and total madness, you can check out our entire miniseries on the Cuban Missile Crisis that we did last year, right here. Follows the crisis day by day in real time. And support our war effort by joining the Time Ghost Army on Patreon or at timeghost.tv. See you next time. Mm -hmm.